parade Even if I ran away Your love never failed No, I still make mistakes But you have mercies for me every day Your love never failed Oh, 
Lord, we think that you're slow in doing things at times. But I'm here today to give you thanksgiving for doing things in your time and for being patient for us. Lord, I know personally if you had done things the time that I wanted you to, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I'm thankful that you have patience with us, and I'm thankful that you don't want us to perish, but to come to repentance to know you and have a relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of time you can be seated. She just killed that last song. That was fantastic. Um, and you know what? She was, she was hoarse this morning. So uh, that shows what God can do. Um, you know, today I think God desires... I know God desires to do something among His people today. Every time that we gather together, I truly believe God desires to do something among us. The question is, do we have eyes that will see and ears that will hear? Because there are also a lot of distractions. There are also a lot of things that I believe that the enemy desires to kind of put in our way so that maybe we won't see or maybe we won't hear what God desires to say to us. And so uh, pray that with me as we begin today. Heavenly Father, today we ask right now that you would just take away those things that might distract us, that God, you would give us eyes to see you at work among us, ears to hear your words, uh, and, and God, the courage and the, the strength to accept them and to put them into practice in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn this morning, if you've got your Bibles, to Luke chapter 15. We started there last week, and we'll begin, uh, we'll, we'll continue that today, and we'll finish this series uh, next week. Three weeks all on the three parables that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15. Last week, we dealt with the first two parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. Today things get a little more personal. We saw last week that, that this chapter really is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a clear, we said this was the, the point in the lake where you can see all the way down to the bottom and see clearly the gospel of Jesus. Today, we look at the same passage, but it takes a little bit more of a personal turn today. Let's read together in Luke chapter 15 beginning with verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who set him out into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer, to be, no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on, his, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Then verse 25 says, Meanwhile, the older son was out in the field, and when he came 
near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, and so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you, have always, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May God bless the reading of his word. This morning we begin to talk about this third parable in Luke chapter 15. All three parables are recorded that Jesus tells here in Luke chapter 15. But today we start parable number three. Last week, We looked at the shepherd who lost the sheep and rejoiced when he found him. We looked at the woman who lost one of her ten precious coins. And today we look at the father and his sons. Some call it the parable of the lost son. It would make sense. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. But that doesn't really, that's not really what I like to call it. In fact, we can see that the son in this parable doesn't really get lost in the same way that the sheep does or in the same way that the coin does. Instead, the son's condition comes really from his own choosing, from his own doing. He doesn't just uh, wake up and he's lost one day. This was his own choice. Over the, over the years, many people have come to call this uh, parable and describe this son as the prodigal son. That fits him a little bit more, but it's also, I just don't know about that title, and here's why. Because prodigal is not a word that you and I really use anymore. In fact, outside of talking about or referring back to this parable in Luke chapter 15, tell me any other time you've used the word prodigal in your normal interactions. Prodigal means spending money or resources freely and recklessly. Another definition goes on to say, wastefully extravagant. Basically, you could call this parable about this boy, you could call him the reckless son or the wasteful son. Timothy Keller, whom I love to to read, uh, he wrote a book all about this parable and he calls it the parable of the two lost sons. I think that's interesting and we'll get to that idea in a few minutes this morning. But before we get caught up on names and what we should call this parable, let's look at how Jesus describes this family in Luke 15 and verse 11. It's very simple. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. So maybe at its its core, we could just call this parable today the parable of the father and two sons. No matter what you call it, this parable is, again, a very clear picture of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And it's actually, I've found over the years, it's actually rather well known even outside the church. A lot of people that even maybe would be unbelievers still know this parable. In fact, it was 19th century English writer Charles Dickens, who you may know wrote some pretty good stories in his own day. He called this parable in Luke 15, the greatest short story ever told. Today we're going to look at it through this particular lens. Today we're going to look at the story through the lens of two brothers. Now, take a look. I know we have a screen that is out. That's part of what's been going on today. So we're down to one screen. I apologize for that. But take a look at this cute, adorably cute picture here on your screen. It's also on your bulletin. I say that because this is not just any two brothers. This is me and my brother up here, right? This was a long, long time ago. I've not been that little in a long time. Uh, I'm the one with the mustache. I'm the cowboy here. Let's all say it together. Oh, isn't that sweet? 
is that the sweetest thing you've seen today? I think, I think it probably is. Uh, and then, yeah, there's my brother over there. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, he, he, this is the cute guy, right? Um, no, this is my brother Jim. My mom always made our homemade our Halloween costumes every year. So I get to be the cute little uh, cowboy with the mustache. And Jim is clown over there. I'm not sure if this is related or not, but Jim is still to this day frightened of clowns. <laughs> Hates them. I don't know if this is where it started, but maybe it did. Um, my brother is uh, a preacher. He is uh, the senior minister at the Indian Hills Christian Church in Danville. And uh, I, I have a very good relationship with my brother. Nonetheless, after he sees that I've preached a sermon with him on the screen, he will probably retaliate at some point. Uh, we're going to look at two brothers. I grew up as the middle child of five children. Uh, and kind of right in the middle were me and my older brother. There were three girls. One um, younger, my ta sister Tabitha is, is actually is older than the two boys. And then two girls were uh, the babies. And there were me and my brother. They are kind of in the middle. Today we're going to look at these two brothers. We're going to look first at the younger of the two brothers that Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 15. So th let's look again at Luke 15 verses 11 and 12. And as we do, we're going to be on the back of our bulletins and we've got some blanks to fill in. We've, uh, we're going to look at three things that the younger brother did. Three things that he did. His part in this story. Number one is his request. We're going to look at the request that he made, and that's found in verses 11 and 12. Look at it again. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. So from these couple short verses, we find out most of what we initially need to know about this family. The father is a wealthy man with a large enough inheritance for his sons to desire to have their share. After all, if this was a poor family with, nothing, with no money at all, then it's unlikely that the sons would be arguing over what they would get. He was probably a wealthy landowner, most likely from a family of farmers, considering how most people in the, middle, in the ancient Middle East earned their living. And he has two sons. And one day, the younger of these two sons, the younger brother, I'm the younger brother in, in this situation, by the way, um, one day the younger brother makes a request of his father. Father, give me my share of the estate. It's a pretty straightforward request. Go ahead and give me what is owed me, what is coming to me. But that is not all there is to the son's request. Those listening to Jesus' parable in that setting would have been shocked at the audacity of this younger son to say such a thing to his father. In fact, I read something from a commentary that said in Jewish culture, had this boy said this very thing, it would have not been unheard of for this father, this Jewish dad, to publicly beat his son for such a request. Here's why. In Jewish culture, the sons would have definitely had an expectation of their share of the family wealth. In fact, when a Jewish father died, the oldest son would receive a double portion of what the rest of the children inherited. In this case, since there were two sons, that means that the oldest brother would have been entitled to two-thirds of his father's estate and the youngest brother to one-third. However, Here's the problem. This division of the estate only occurred when? When the father died. This was something that happened just like the, a, a will being executed today. You don't go and ask for the will to be read and the estate to be settled and the, the money to be divided up until the father's died. Instead, the request that this son is making to receive his inheritance is that he would receive it now. 
while the father was still alive. This would have been interpreted by Jesus' Jewish listeners as a deep sign of disrespect. Basically, you know what this boy is saying? The younger brother is saying to his father, I wish you were dead right now. My share of the inheritance is more important than having you, my father, around. Not to mention the fact of how hard it would have been for for him to divide up the inheritance in the first place. In that day, most people did not own a lot of money and just have it sitting in a bank somewhere that you could divide. Most, uh, Most wealth was in possessions and especially in property, in land. And so, to divide up this estate, as the son asked him to do, would have meant to sell off a third of the father's property and get rid of it before the father was dead. Now, we're going to take a look at the father's point of view in this story and finish it all up with that next week. But before we do, let me just ask you a question. What do you think it does to God when you deliberately sin against Him? You see, you and I are thinking maybe from the perspective of a father or a mother and what we would do in that situation. What moms and dads would do if their kids said, basically, I wish you were dead so that I could have all my stuff. And so let's take this to to the Heavenly Father. What do you think it does to God, to the Father's heart, when you on purpose deliberately sin against Him? You see, if sin is a separation from God then to do so willingly would be to say, I would rather have things my own way than to stay here in relationship with you. We've looked at his request. Let's move on. Look at number two. This younger brother's fall. That's what the next part of the story talks about. Luke 15, look at verse 13 this time. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And so after the son gathers, all, gathers together all the proceeds he's made from the selling off of his father's estate, he leaves. But think about how he's leaving. He's not leaving with the intention of coming back. He has sold off a third of his father's estate. He's already collected everything that the father owed him. There would be no reason even for him to come back after his father's death. Everything is settled up with this younger son. He's done with his family. Basically, he's written himself out of the will, collected what's due him, and he's on his way. You see, this boy, I fully believe, did not have any intention of ever coming back home. He made sure of that when he went ahead and asked for everything that was owed him. Stop then just for a moment and think about this. How would you take this situation then if you were in the shoes of the older brother? If you were the older brother who stayed behind and watched your younger brother not only make such a disrespectful request to your father and basically go ahead and blow everything that, that he owned, a third of everything your dad owned, what do you think would be the perspective of that older brother against his younger brother? You see, the son's departure here is his attempt to remove himself from his family identity. He's not just leaving home. He's leaving his family behind for good. Until something in the story happens. Look at Luke 15, verses 14 through 16. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went out and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. No one gave him anything. 
So, look how far the sun has fallen. The son thinks that he, he is ready to spend all this stuff that he has. The son asks for his share, and he goes out after all the properties divided up, after the, the father says goodbye, and the son goes out and blows everything. And look how far he falls. There's two things in this story that have contributed to the son's, this younger brother's fall. It's the next two lines in your bulletin notes two contributing factors that have caused his fall number one is choice and number two is circumstance number one is this son's choice number two is his circumstance look again at verse 14 very quickly he says it says after he had spent everything that is this son's choice that is his on purpose dealings. He on purpose spent everything. And after he did, what happens? There was a famine. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. You see, as much as we might hold against this younger brother, as much disrespect as he showed to his father when he said, Give me what's owed me, there's one thing this boy didn't do he did not cause the famine in that land. This was not his fault, right? He didn't have anything to do with the ground drying up and there being no crops and no food for everybody. In fact, had he known that, maybe, just maybe, he would have spent his money a little bit different. We don't know. There are two things at play here. He's been hit by a very hard circumstance. And you know what? Some of you in your life have been hit by some very hard circumstances, things that you had no choice in the matter. And this son has hit what you and I would call rock bottom. Raise your hand if you would say at some point in your life you've, you've hit what you have considered rock bottom, a rock bottom kind of a moment. I've talked to a whole lot of people in their rock bottom moment of need kind of situation. But there's something we forget in every situation, in almost every situation, that there's also... While our circumstances have hit us hard, there's also an element of choice in just about every situation we find ourselves in. It's not just the circumstances we face. And most of the time, our choice is we turn our eyes away from the Father. Most of the time, we have fallen even further away, not just because of the circumstances we face, but because we thought we could do this on our own. And we therefore have chosen to turn away. I look at a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people. They look for advice. They look for counsel. Because they've hit that rock bottom kind of moment. And look how far this son fell. Look how far this younger brother fell. He hired himself out as a hired servant, to feed a guy's pigs. He sent him out into the field. He was going to go feed this man's pigs. Now, Jesus is talking here to a Jewish audience. Audience. Tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, tax collectors, or Pharisees and teachers of the law, rather. It's, it's understandable, then, that Jesus is telling a story about a Jewish boy. Jesus is talking about a Jewish son. And if that were the case, he's going out to a pig farmer. Pigs, by the way, according to the Old Testament law, are not clean animals. They're not animals that you would eat. They're not animals that you would uh, touch, much less eat. And so he's going, this Jewish son is going to be hired out by a Gentile pig farmer. But did you notice that's not as far down as he goes? Because what does he desire to do? He gets so hungry that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. That's a little bit lower than eating an unclean pig. This is eating pig slop, and that's what he desired to do. I'm not so sure that I've ever been that hungry. I don't know about you, maybe you have. Eventually, this boy comes to his senses. Eventually, the younger brother hits rock bottom and guess what most often rock bottom 
causes us to look up. There's really no other direction to be able to look. That's how it almost always happens. But you don't know how many times that I've sat and counseled with people in those rock bottom moments looking up and they finally they're turning their lives back to God because they can't lead their lives anymore. They can't do this on their own. And as they leave my office, I think just about the same thing just about every time. If only they'd turn to God before their lives fell apart. You see, this realization that the younger brother eventually comes to, he could have made it at any time. He could have turned around at any time and been accepted by his father. But it took him no longer being able to be in control. It took his pride being knocked out before he would turn around. But eventually, he makes a decision. That's number three. Number three that this son did is his decision. Look at his decision in in verses 17 through 20 it says when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death I will set out and go back to my father and say to him father I've sinned against heaven and against you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like that of one of your hired servants so he got up and went to his father Finally, only as this younger brother has reached rock bottom does he realize what he's done. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against my dad. You see, this son had gone from being an heir of a large family fortune to being an independently wealthy man living out on the town to being a hired hand at a Gentile pig farm. And finally, he realizes if I'm going to go be a hired hand, if I'm going to be hired out to work for somebody, it might as well be for my dad. Those guys at home, I've seen how his hired hands live. They have food to spare, and here I am wanting to eat the pig slop. What is the picture here? What is the decision that this son is making here spiritually? It's the next line on the left side of your bulletin. We call it repentance. We call it repentance. At another point in his ministry, Jesus is talking once again to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And they once again raise up the issue about why do you spend time with sinners? Look at what Jesus says in Luke 5, verses 31 through 32. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Verse 32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and Jesus is telling us why He came. Why is it? It's not for the righteous. Jesus came to bring sinners to repentance. This is literally what the younger son did here. Look at what Acts 3.19 says. This is Peter speaking. He says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and so that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is literally what this younger brother did. He repented. He turned in the opposite direction. He had been running from his father all this time. He had purposefully turned his back, separated himself from his father and his family, and now, what does he do? He comes to his senses. He turns back toward his father, and he goes home. Today, there's someone here who's turned their back on their father. Today, there's someone here who's turned their back on the Heavenly Father. You thought you could do it alone. You thought you had a better plan all along. And it's costing you everything. 
Who knows why you've stayed away? Maybe it's just stubbornness or pride. But Luke 15 keeps bringing us back to this truth. Our Heavenly Father's heart is for the lost. Our Heavenly Father's heart still beats for those who are lost without Him. Even when you've deliberately turned your back on Him. Even when you've on purpose cut yourself off from His family. He still desires for you to turn around and come home. Before we move on here and look now at the older brother, I want us to look one more time at the audience that Jesus is speaking to in Luke chapter 15. Look at the very first three verses of Luke 15. Look at what he says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then... Jesus told them this parable. The repentant younger brother is clearly an image here of the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus is gathering around. It also seems clear that Jesus is using then the rest of this story with that second audience in mind. That of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You see, if this was just a story about repentance and redemption, it would have been a much shorter story. It would have finished around verse 24 or so. But Jesus throws in this character of the older brother for the benefit of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You see, the Pharisees were the religious, Jewish religious elite. A group of religious teachers and leaders who were highly trained in the Old Testament law, and they prided themselves on their adherence to it. They especially would have kept all of the Jewish dietary and cleanliness laws. At one point in Scripture, they scolded Jesus because His disciples didn't wash their hands before a meal. And therefore, they would have despised and ignored these sinners that Jesus entertained. They also had trouble with the tax collectors that were there with Him that Jesus was welcoming. Pharisees accepted the leadership of the Roman government, but they resented Roman rule and they waited for a day when they would be free of it. In fact, the reason that the Pharisees waited for a Messiah to come that the Old Testament Scriptures predicted was so that He would pull them out from under Roman rule so that he would free them from the yoke of oppression. The tax collectors and, or the Herodians, for, uh, on the other hand, had betrayed their Jewish brothers. That's how the Pharisees viewed it. By agreeing to work for the Roman government and collect taxes from their fellow Jews. These guys were not very well liked. And so Jesus clearly here brings up this character of the older brother and turns this story in a whole different direction to serve as a mirror of that hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that Jesus is teaching here. So let's look at this older brother. We've got two brothers. One is left, one stayed home. And now let's look at the older brother in this story. And as we do in your notes, we're going to look at the things, three things that the oldest brother refused to do. You see, let, let's read a verse from James before we go on and look at this older brother. Let's look at what James 4.17 says. It says, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Here's the way the verse uh, that I learned the verse when I was a kid. James 4.17 Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You see, we look at this younger brother and we see clearly all the things he's done. We know the things that he wasn't supposed to do that he's done in, in sinning against his father. But that's not the only kind of sin, now is it? You see, the Pharisees prided themselves in not doing the things you weren't 
supposed to do. As some of us do today. But they had sinned nonetheless. But their sins were more acts of omission. The things that they were supposed to be doing all along that they weren't doing. So let's look then at three things that the older brother refused to do. Number one, he refused to rejoice with his brother. He refuses to rejoice with his brother. That's when he comes home, when he hears what's going on. That's when he hears, oh yeah, we're having a party. That's the music and dancing that you hear. Your brother's home. Look at what he says, what it says in uh, verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. On his return to the father, the younger son does not only receive acceptance and welcome and forgiveness, he gets a party. The father says, bring him a robe, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, kill the biggest calf we got. Let's have a party, let's have a feast and celebrate. The older brother, however, wanted nothing to do with it. He refused to join the rejoicing. Likewise, the tax collectors and sinners that came to Jesus and found salvation in Jesus, my guess is they probably would have known how to celebrate. Maybe they were even throwing a party there with Jesus that day. Maybe that's part of why the Pharisees were so adamantly opposed to Jesus spending time with them. But notice as we move on, number two, notice that the older brother didn't just choose to stay away from this celebration. Number two, he refused to claim his brother. Number two, he refused to claim his brother. Look at verse 30. What does he say? He says, but when this son of yours... Huh. That's loaded, right? He doesn't say, but when my brother came home, or when whatever his name is, we don't know, Jim, maybe, I I don't know. Um, No, that's my brother, never mind. Um, Whenever, he says, whenever this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Maybe the father had welcomed the younger brother back home. But the older brother wasn't about to. As far as he he was concerned, his brother was still dead. Likewise, the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus was with that day, they were all biologically descendants of Adam. They were all ethnically Jewish, but the Pharisees would have by no means accepted them as family. They couldn't get past the sins that these tax collectors and sinners had committed. They couldn't get past the lives that these guys and girls had lived before they found salvation in Jesus Christ. Does this still happen in our churches today? You see, I'm convinced that if Jesus Christ were to come down into most of our churches today, He would call out a lot of so-called Christians for the very same behaviors that Jesus continued to hold against the Pharisees. So let me ask you, Is there someone today who has gone too far to deserve your acceptance? Maybe the Father has opened His arms to them. Maybe they've repented and turned to Him and the Father has given forgiveness of sins and the Father has welcomed them back into His arms, but you can't do it. Is there somebody who's gone too far to deserve your forgiveness? Look at what Jesus says about this issue in Matthew Chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, for if, you forgive, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Church, this is serious. This is heaven and hell kinds of stuff. And some of us cannot let go. Earlier, I mentioned that Timothy Keller calls this parable the parable of the two lost sons. He holds that not just the younger prodigal brother had sinned and was lost, but 
that both sons had separated themselves from their father's love. Look at what Jesus says about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 13. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why? What are they doing? He says, You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you, in, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. In other words, you know what these Pharisees were doing? They were trying their best because of these people's past to, to keep out the, the tax collectors, to keep out the sinners, and keep them out of the kingdom of heaven. They were trying to keep them from receiving the grace of God. And you know what was happening? God was forgiving and giving them grace, and they, in shutting the door, were keeping themselves out of the kingdom of heaven. Because they couldn't do it. This brother refused to celebrate with, with his younger brother. He refused to claim his younger brother. And look at number three, what he refused to do. He refused to see his father's blessings. This is how Jesus finishes this parable. In verses 29 through 32. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. But look at what the father says in response. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This son was unable to rejoice when his father threw this party for his younger brother. Why? Why is that? Because he was worried about the fact that he had never received such a party from his father. His dad had never even given him a young goat to celebrate with. Now, we don't really celebrate. If somebody gave me a young goat, I wouldn't really think a party was in order. But uh, we celebrate in different ways today, right? But we understand what he's saying here. All this time, I never even left. I've always worked for you. I've always been on your side. I never asked for you to divide everything up. I never asked that, that I be written out of this family. I've always been loyal. I've always been here. And you don't give me even a small party. But what's the older brother missing here? He's missing that all along he has had access to everything the father had. He had a roof over his head and sandals on his feet and a robe on his back. He didn't need those things. He already had them. He had a place to sleep and food to eat and clothes to wear. And not only that, he still had two-thirds of his father's estate coming to him when his father was to pass away. He had taken his eyes off of the blessings coming to him. The blessings of living with the father. And he was focused on what this ungrateful brother of his was getting. Church, do we realize all that we already have as children of God? Or are we blinded by our unforgiveness and our unacceptance of those who Christ has already forgiven and accepted? Ultimately, why didn't the older brother accept his estranged younger brother? And why did he turn his back on his father's love? Because his life had become all about him. It didn't matter if his brother was home or not. He felt unfairly treated. And you and I act the very same way sometimes. We would, be rather, we, we would rather things be the way that we want them to be because we've stopped being concerned with those who are lost and don't know the Father. Today, I want to think about one last thing as we close. 
as I've come to back to this parable and studied, again, studied it again for this week, one more ha thing has struck me about how Jesus tells this parable. As the parable comes to a close in Luke chapter 15, the relationship between the younger brother and their dad is restored. The son has come back and repented, and the father has thrown his arms of love and mercy around his boy. That chapter is closed. But we never know what becomes of the older son. The father explains his decision and he invites the older boy to come and celebrate with the family. But Jesus never tells us about the oldest son's decision. Jesus leaves it up in the air. Does he swallow his pride and go back into the house, accept his brother and join the party? Or does he stay outside and sulk? Maybe he even packs up his own things and leaves and walks out and leaves the father further rejecting the father's love. We don't know what happened. Jesus doesn't finish that part of the story. Instead, the story closes with that choice still left to be made. I'm going to ask Corey and the band if they would come out today as we prepare for our time of invitation. And as we do, I want to draw your attention to that choice. You see, we don't know what the older brother did. I think there's a reason Jesus left that open. Because he's standing there looking at the Pharisees, and basically he says, the ball's in your court. The choice is yours. So what's your choice today? Will you join the celebration of the Father and the angels in heaven and go out and work to bring in the lost so that they can know the Father's love? Or can you not let go? Because you've made this all about you instead of about the lost. You see, a lot of times we get bogged down. A lot of times we end up in the, the shoes of the older brother. And we end up separating ourselves from God. We end up angry with the people that are coming and accepting and receiving the gift of God. And you know why that happens? Because over time, for whatever reason, you and I have forgotten. We've forgotten that once upon a time, I was that lost son. That once upon a time, I was that boy who had abandoned the father. That once upon a time, you were that lost daughter. The one that turned her back on her father. The one that turned away and lived a life of sin. And you know what? God accepted us back in. No matter how far we had gone, no matter what things we had done, God brought us back and God wrapped us in His arms and God rejoiced over us. You know what, church? God now desires to use you and to use me to go and bring those lost children in. We've, we've lost our focus because we've put our eyes We've taken our eyes off the Father and His grace and mercy and we've put our eyes on ourselves. And let me tell you this, church, when your eyes are focused on you, you'll never make the right decisions. That's what the Pharisees had done and they had shut themselves out of the kingdom of heaven. So today as we have this time of invitation, there's two decisions that need to be made. Maybe you need to turn your eyes back on Jesus. Maybe you've been found for a long time, but you're living like the stubborn older brother who wishes things were all about him. Or maybe today there is somebody here. Maybe today there's a younger brother, a younger sister who's still turning their back on God and needs to come back to Him. You see, today the invitation of Jesus Christ is open. Today the Father's arms are open. You just got to turn around and come back. He desires for you too today as we stand and as we sing.
took a breath, you breathed your life to me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh,
I know there are a lot of people here, because I've talked to a lot of them this week, and you're struggling. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it, what's happened that in each situation, but I, I know this. There are a lot of people that end up in that position of the, the brother, the younger brother. They end up turning around and, and hitting rock bottom and realizing the father's still there. I can turn around and go to the father. And you know what? They could have done that at any time. They could have turned around at any point. It didn't have to get that bad. But sometimes we hold on so hard to the control of our lives. We try so hard to lead and guide and direct our own lives that the only chance we have to look up is, is when we've hit our lowest point. Church, it doesn't have to be that way. The Father stands with His arms open right now. No matter where you're at on that road away from home, you can turn around and He'll be there. Next week, we're going to look at that, Father. Next week, that's how we're going to close this series by looking at that reckless, wonderful love of God. Pray with me as we close. Father, today we're grateful for Your love. We're grateful for Your mercy and for Your forgiveness. Even, God, when we've, we've done a lot of things and we've, we've run away for a long time. And so, Father, if there's one today that needs to know that grace, Father, draw them near and convict them of that truth. And Father, for everyone else, Father, God, we thank You for our salvation. We thank You that You have found us. And God, now send us out in the world to find those lost sheep. That they would know the truth of Jesus Christ. We pray in the saving name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you all. Thank you.